You know, this morning, you're, you're going to get blessed by a ministry of a friend of mine and my wife, uh, him and his wife, they love people. They love Jesus, and because they love Jesus, they love people. And God has used him tremendously. And I share this because he probably won't share this, but he, uh, Chi Alpha, that's Greek letters for, for CA, which is Christ Ambassadors. Chi Alpha is a dynamic campus ministry in the secular universities of America. Many, many years ago, the Lord uh, uh, tricked him, and he ended up at Sam Houston State University. Uh, it's a long story. And started a, the first Chi Alpha there. Well, that blew up and became one of the largest, if not the largest campus ministry. Still going today, 20, 30 years later. My son goes to Sam Houston. He's part of Chi Alpha. We're grateful for Chi Alpha. And um, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people that come to church and on, on Thursday night and are involved in, in, in fellowship and interaction and learning how to be followers of Christ. Hun hundreds, hundreds. Also, they have out of that ministry, hundreds, hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, of young people have been called to the ministry and are serving as missionaries and pastors and youth pastors throughout the world. Subsequent to that, uh, he helped start other Kayafa. And the Lord has just promoted him, him and his wife, man, uh, oversee the Kayafa ministry over the entire state of Texas. The, the Assemblies of God were divided into three districts, North Texas, North, North Texas, South Texas, and West Texas. And, 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 and every district has said, can you come oversee ours? Oversee ours. And then New Mexico, so, uh, might as well just give them California, right? Um, uh, just a, a great job right now. Sent, uh, preparing to launch a team of 30 young adults that are going to move to Boston, live in Boston to help start, just like starting a church, starting a Kayafa in Boston. Crazy. Uh, it's either crazy or God, right? Uh, have, have you been to the Northeast re recently? Amen. It's expensive. I, I, I don't plan to go to the Northeast to visit family for a while because of the crime and everything, but it's expensive. It's crazy or God. And um, loves the Lord, and God has used them tremendously but his claim to fame is that he loves Jesus. And he wants everyone that he meets to love Jesus also. And when you love Jesus, you want to be a follower of Jesus. You want to be a follower of Jesus. Amen. So before you see it, could you make welcome to Family Life Assembly of God, uh, uh, Eli Goudreau. And I'm going to have his wife stand where she at. She will wave over here. Amen. Brother Eli Goudreau, man of God. Amen. And I pray that... You'll be attentive to the word of God upon us. Let's give, a Lord, let's give the Lord a hand this morning now. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. God bless you all. You may be seated. So wonderful. It feels like such a privilege to be able to worship our King Jesus with a wonderful congregation like this. I trust you sense the presence of the Holy Spirit among us. Amen. Amen. We are going to be looking in Luke chapter 15. That's where we'll be starting in just a moment. As you're turning there, let me just follow up with what Pastor said in introducing us, uh, Mary and I as Chi Alpha directors. Again, Chi Alpha is the Assemblies of God ministry to the secular university campus. I realize in a congregation of this size, there's probably many of you that either have um, a child or a grandchild perhaps, or even a neighbor, a friend across the street, somebody, a co-worker's kid is going off to university. And I can tell you that the secular university campus um, can be a challenging place to a young Christian. Conversely, it can be a wonderful place to not just, we believe in Christian community, these young folks can not just survive the university campus experience, but thrive and grow in the grace and knowledge of God there. Uh, if they try to do it by themselves, it's probably not going to go well. If they're a part of Christian community, they're probably going to do really good. And so if you're here and you know somebody that's going to a university campus, really around the nation, especially around Texas, New Mexico, that's our specific territory right now, but we have friends that are scattered all over the nation that lead Chi Alpha Ministries. If you want to give us their name, any contact information you feel comfortable giving us, their social media contact, their cell phone, whatever you feel good about giving us, we will promise to you that we will lovingly stalk them for Jesus. 
And uh, Mary is here on the front row, and she'll just stand up or wave, or if you don't mind, if you would see her at the close of the service, again, you can just write that down on any scrap of paper, and we will treat that seriously, and we'll pass that along to our friends on these university campuses, and we'll do our, do our best to make sure that your loved one has an opportunity to participate in Christian community as they go off to pursue their studies. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15, and we're going to read some familiar passages of passages of scripture here, just the first six verses. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Let's pray together one more time. Father, we recognize the familiarity of this passage of scripture, so we ask intently this morning for revelation from your Holy Spirit. We recognize our tendency to dismiss things that we're familiar with, but we know, Lord, this is actually a revelation of your heart. There's depths here that we don't understand, that we don't see yet, so we open our minds and we open our hearts to you and we invite you, Holy Spirit, to illuminate your word and illuminate who you are and what you are like, your very heart to us, today and that you would help us then Lord have grace to not just be hearers of your word but to be doers of your word we want to be like you and we want to be like your beautiful son Jesus so we mean this with all of our heart Holy Spirit please come reveal to us your heart in Jesus name we pray amen we had a young man who came to Chi Alpha at Samuelson State uh, from the kind of rough side of San Antonio. He, his family, um, many of them had participated in gang life, were in prison. It was, I won't go into detail, it was just pretty rough upbringing for this young man, but he got a scholarship to go to university, and this was kind of his ticket out, so to speak, the way he was going to better himself. He wasn't a Christian, but he did want to break free from that life cycle of death. And so he came to the university, and some Chi Alpha students met him, these young Christian students involved in our community, and they're what we call small group leaders. Small group leaders are folks who go out, and we teach them that their job as a shepherd is to find, to feed, and to fight for the lost lambs of God. That's their job, to find, to feed, and to fight for the lost lambs of God. So this young man, Jeff, met some young Chi Alphans, and he didn't really like them because they were what he called goodies. They didn't want to party or, you know, carouse like uh, he thought university students were supposed to do. And, uh, but they were his only friends, and he needed an intramural team. He wanted to play intramurals. He was an athlete, and um, so he decided he'd let them be their intramural team. So they joined a soccer league intramurally, and they were playing a game, one particular game, uh, against some social frat, um, frat guys on campus, and... Just to be frank with you, these frat guys were smoking the Chi Alpha guys. I mean, it was like 11 to 1 or something like that. Because these Chi Alpha guys, if I can just be so, I'll just be honest with you. They're, um, they weren't really athletic. They were kind of more gamers, you know what I mean? They had more uh, muscles in their thumbs than they did in their thighs. And, uh, but they were playing the game because they were trying to find, feed, and fight for the lost lambs of God. They were trying to win this guy's heart. So, you know, and the other thing is their identity is not wrapped up in whether they win or lose an intramural soccer game. So they're just out there kind of having fun. And uh, Jeff, at one point, who was so competitive, got really, really angry at them. He got so angry that in front of hundreds of students watching these games, he began to curse out his small group leader, David. And I will not even try to paint the picture of the depths of depravity of his language, but it was bad, okay? We'll just say that. It was really bad, very loud, because he's so mad because they're not trying. And then he marches off the field. Well, he goes home, and he's not a Christian, but he does have a conscience. 
And so the next morning he wakes up and he feels a little bit guilty about the way he's treated his only friends on campus. He thinks these guys are nice to me. I, I got to go apologize to him. So he goes to David, his small group leader's house. And he, David lives in a, in a house with like four other Chi Alpha young men across the street from campus. And, you know, it's kind of typical university housing. The door's always open. So Jeff walks in, but nobody's there, although he hears a voice from David's bedroom, which is down the hall. He walks down the hall and walks in the bedroom, and he can't see David, but then he begins to hear David's voice because these Chi Alpha guys, what they've done is they've taken these old homes across from the campus and turned the big walk-in closets into prayer closets. And Jeff sits down on the foot of David's bed, and he listens for five or ten minutes while David intercedes for his soul. And cries out to God for this lost lamb to come home. Cries out that he would know the love of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you can imagine when David came out of the closet that Jeff looked at him with this look of intensity. And his question, the first question was, what, what were you doing in there? And David explained, I didn't expect to see you, but I, I was praying for you. The second question, the one that's pertinent for us this morning is Why? Why would you do that after the way I treated you? Why would you, why would you pray for me after what I did to you in front of hundreds of people last night? The things that I said to you, why would you do that? And of course, David was able to explain the love of God, the forgiveness of Christ to him. David ended up being a missionary and Jeff, a youth pastor. Great story, right? Now, you know, yeah, praise the Lord. That's pretty much what's going on in this parable that I just read for you. Let's see if we can dive into this and learn something about the heart of God. I, we gotta do just a little bit of context here. If you, go back to, if you go back to Luke 14, it's one of those occasions where Jesus is laying out the terms of discipleship. In Luke 14, Jesus is, in other words, we'll say Jesus was preaching it pretty hard. Have you ever noticed that Jesus could do that? Jesus in Luke 14 is saying, if you're going to be a real disciple, not just a church member who signs on the line somewhere, but a real follower of Christ, this is what it's going to take. And he says some pretty hard things. Now, the interesting thing is as he preaches that, it polarizes the crowd. Now, here's what's interesting. The polarization is not what you'd expect because it's the irreligious people who are drawn to Jesus in this moment, the tax collectors and the sinners and those who are irreligious, but it's the religious people who are stepping away from Jesus and they're, they're, they're stepping back and they're beginning to point their fingers at him and say, but this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. And really what's going on here, although they don't verbalize it, what they're saying is that, hey, Jesus, why do you love lost people so much? Hey, Jesus, why are you always pursuing sinners. Hey, Jesus, why are you befriending sinners? Why do you eat in their homes? Hey, Jesus, why would you allow a woman who had lived a sinful life to wash your feet with her tears and wipe your feet with her hair? If you were a holy man, why would you do these things that you do? And so really this, um, man, Luke 15 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Honestly, it probably vacillates between Isaiah 53 and Luke 15. It's just, in my estimation, a revelation of the heart of God. What we have here in Luke 15, and we don't have time to go through all three parables, but I know a lot of you are familiar enough with the scripture to remember that this is a series of three parables. What we have here is a revelation, honestly, of the heart of Jesus in why he would pursue, why he would welcome, why he would befriend the lost. And I think in answer to that question, hey, Jesus, why do you do this? I think he would give us two simple, two simple answers. And we want to look into these this morning. The first one, I think Jesus, in answering why he would pursue sinners, would say, first, because God suffers when one is lost. Have you ever lost something valuable to you? such as um, cell phone. Thank God for find my iPhone, right? 
$900 phone. You want to be able to find that. Car key, you know, it used to be that a car key was $2, and now they have chips in them that are $200. It's a terrible thing to lose your car key. What about maybe something a little more sentimental like a wedding ring? This is my third ring. First wife, third ring. And thank God it was my ring and not hers because hers is two months' salary. Mine cost $65 at James Avery. <laughs> but it's a sentimental value, right? I, precious. We were like the woman in the second parable tearing up the whole house looking for that ring. Maybe one day we'll find it. Something valuable to you that you've lost. Maybe a, a pet. That's really sad when you lose a pet, unless, of course, it's a cat and then nobody cares, right? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I did not mean that. We're Christian people. We love all God's creation. Okay. <laughs> your, your, your face. <laughs> I totally lost you. I'm so sorry. Your face was precious. I'm so sorry. You know the difference between a cat and a dog, though. A dog really wants to be a person, and a cat wants to be God. Isn't that true? It's pretty true. When I think about losing something valuable, my mind goes immediately to the day that we lost our three-year-old daughter. And the story has a happy ending, so bear with me. But we were, we were separated from our daughter for an extended time in an unfamiliar place. And some of you, if any of you had this experience where you were searching, separated maybe from a, a child, we were actually on an unfamiliar university campus in a different state, and I was teaching a class with some young college students when Mary interrupted the class with a look of despair on her face that I'd never seen before, nor since. And the, the words that came out of her mouth was, I've, I've lost Corey. Corey, Corinne Michelle is our, our youngest daughter who's, who's now happily married and a missionary, but we, we were separated from her. Um, Mary had turned around to do some photocopying for a class I was teaching and then when she turned around and if you've had this experience it happens so quick these little ones that can wander, wander away as a toddler and um, at, at this point she had been separated from Corey for about 15 minutes and so of course we immediately disbanded the class I think there might have been 25 or so college students in that class and we began the really to go into search and rescue mode we went through every floor of this three-story building on this college campus and we were looking everywhere and every there were a kitchen facility we we're looking at the cabinets and the stairwells in every classroom up and down the stairs and if you've had this experience you know this that the worst thing about it is the clock is ticking and it goes from 15 minutes to 30 minutes at about 40 or 45 minutes we got the university police department in and your mind is just swirling because you're thinking, you know, an hour in, we got the city police department in, and you're thinking if some, if some creep has my daughter in a vehicle on the interstate, he's already in another city by now, and, and you're just praying, and you're desperate for something to happen. And then at about an hour and 15 minutes, we found her. And we didn't think to even look in one of the dormitories, but what had happened is she had wondered, remember, she's three, three years old, she had wandered out of the building across two different parking lots and into the dormitory that you had to have key access to even get into, but somebody had opened the door for her. And when we found her, we actually found her in another lecturer's room. She was seated cross-legged on the floor with the other lecturer's daughter playing Hot Wheels and Barbie and eating goldfish. She was having a party. How many understand she didn't even know she was lost? My little lamb had no idea of the precarious position she'd placed herself in when she wandered away from the care of her loving mother and father. She had no idea she was lost. Most people in this world have no idea that they're lost. You know that. I work with university students. That's what they do. They play Hot Wheels and Barbie. You know, they eat goldfish. That's what they do. They don't know that they're lost. I think the more pertinent question I have for you this morning is, who suffered most during that hour and 15 minutes? The little girl that was lost or the mom and dad who lost their little lamb? Hey, Jesus, why do you always pursue 
lost people. Hey, Jesus, why is this such a big deal to you? Why are you always pursuing, befriending, and welcoming, and eating with them? And Jesus would say, because God suffers when one is lost. So what's this parable really about? What's the whole chapter really about? I want to press us a little bit on this. And, and the emphasis in all three of these parables is not so much about the thing that was lost as about the one who lost the valuable thing. We can say it this way, that if you're going to make a movie out of these three parables or each parable, you, the main character is not the lost lamb. The main character is not the lost coin. The main character is not the prodigal. The main character is the shepherd and the woman and the father. Now, we don't normally do this as, you know, as preachers, we, we kind of shift and place the emphasis on the lost lamb. And if you're, good, if you're a good preacher, you, you paint a picture of the lamb that's wandered away from the care of the fold. And if you're really good, then you can, you know, you can paint a picture of the lamb on a rocky precipice. And, and you can paint a picture of a salivating wolf. And the sun goes down and it gets cold because it's in the desert. And if you're really good, you have sound effects like, you know, bah! like, you know, I'm. Because normally what we're trying to do is invoke pity for the lost lamb, and then we'll take up a missions offering, right? That's the way we normally do it. I don't know how you invoke pity for the lost coin, you know, the poor lost coin that fell out of your pocket in the lazy boy and it's down there with the dog hair and the skittles or something, you know. And then of course we talk about the prodigal and he really did become hungry after spending all his father's income on riotous living. But can I tell you that that is not where Jesus placed the emphasis. This parable is about the shepherd's heart. The parable, the second one is about the woman's heart. And the third parable, we ought not to even call it the parable of the prodigal because can I tell you the original hearers in that day, they weren't surprised that a young man would take his father's living and blow it on, on riotous living and prostitutes. That did not surprise anybody about the way young men act in those days nor in this day. What shocked everybody was not the young man, but the way the father responded. The parable ought to be called the parable of the father's heart because nobody responded that way. So Jesus, why do you do this? Why, in fact, did you leave heaven and come to earth? And Jesus would say, because God suffers when one is lost. Like any good father, he can't rest until his children are home because God's heart is broken because he alone carries the weight of eternity and he knows the ultimate consequences of being forever lost. So God actually grieves deeply at the lostness of every man, woman, and child. And when I think about what I experience for an hour and 15 minutes and I try to magnify that and multiply that to billions of people, not just present, but the past grief of God, the present grief of God. And I try to understand what it is that he carries for his lost lambs. And it's overwhelming. I was on an airplane one time and I foolishly asked God, I was just praying for a few hours and asking God, would you give me a revelation of your heart? Show me what it is that you feel and just waves of grief came over me in that moment. So much that we had to, I just had to ask him to stay his hand because God suffers over his lost kids. And of course we realize that Jesus came and made provision for every one of them. And he actually is still waiting for his church to finish the task, but 2000 years later, the Great Commission remains unfulfilled. 
More than 3 billion people, making up almost 7,000 unreached people groups, and half of those are totally unengaged. That means there's no missionaries, there's no local churches, there's no gospel access. They don't even know that they're lost. How many, how many of you had a curfew in high school? That's a good thing to have, by the way. I, I, I remember going to, my, um, going to my dad and saying, Dad, I'm 18 years old. I was a senior in high school. In fact, I think it was about graduation time. I'm 18 years old, and this is embarrassing. I have a, I have a 10 p.m. curfew. Like, I'm a grown-up now. Come on, please, at least midnight or something like that. And Dad, pretty much, if you've done this, Dad always says the same thing. What does he say? Go talk to mom. That's what he says. <laughs> so I go to mom. Mom, please. At least midnight. And, and mom always says something similar. Almost always it's something like this. She'll say, son, you don't understand. I can't sleep. I can't rest until you're home safe and sound. You understand what I'm saying? Can I tell you that God's like any good father? And he will not rest until his lambs are brought back home. There's a suffering in the heart of God. And my question to us as Christian people today is, do we know him well enough to feel that pain? Can I tell you that one of the worst experiences in all of life is to watch someone that you really love suffer? Not everybody in this room has probably had this experience, but many of you have had this experience. You've sat by the hospital bed of somebody that you love dearly and you've held their hand as they gasped for breath and they dealt with intense pain. And if you really love them, you, you would do anything to alleviate that suffering. If you really love them, you, you'd even trade places with them. You'd, you, you'd do anything to change that suffering to alleviate that pain. So the question for us is, do we, do we know God well enough to feel the pain of his heart and do we, do we love him enough to want to do something about it? And I realize we're wading into some kind of deep theological waters here, but let me, I, I told you, I think Jesus would answer this question, why do you do what you do? And I think you'd answer it firstly, because God's heart is broken and God suffers deeply, but then he'd give us a second reason. And this is where we kind of turn that coin over and we look at the opposite side of the same coin. And he would say, not only does God suffer when one is lost, but how many understand God rejoices when one is found? Amen. Jesus, why do you do this? Well, I do it for God because his heart is broken when one of his lost lambs doesn't make it home, but his heart rejoices when one does come home. So we didn't read it, but you know the the chapter in verse seven, it says that there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. In verse 10, he says it again, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And we, we scratch our heads and we think about that. Does that mean what I think it means? That 30 years ago when this redheaded, freckle-faced college student, when I gave my heart to Jesus, that the angels of heaven rejoiced over, over me? Is that what it means? And is it, it, it means it about you too? Okay, we gotta chew on this. Why, why would the angels do that? I mean, are they, are they bored? <laughs> are, they, are they just easily entertained? Like, why would they rejoice over one soul coming back home? I, I can't prove what I'm about to say to you, but here's, here's my theory. I don't think the angels are so much attentive to you and I, and I know that some are, but I think the angels we're talking about here in heaven are more in tune with the throne than they are with us. The Hebrew theologians talk about the panim of God, the, the face of God, the countenance of God. Here's what I think. I think the angels in heaven are worshiping around the throne and they're seeing the very countenance of God shift when one sinner comes home and the grief of God turns to a smile and the angels just begin to rejoice. Because that's the heart of God, you see. 
My daughter led her first friend to Jesus when she was, I think, 13. And um, she, had, she had invited a young lady on her, um, on her athletic club to come to church with her. And it was one of, those, one of those moments where the youth pastor was preaching that night prophetically. He's no idea, he could have had no idea what this young lady, my daughter's friend, was going through with a horrendous divorce of her parents. But he was speaking the word of God and the gospel that night. And it got so intense in this young lady's heart that she, she got up and she ran out of the, the back of the room. When somebody runs away, don't think it's because God's not doing something. Oftentimes it's because God is doing something. My daughter got up and followed her into the ladies' restroom and there was able to hug her and pray with her and counsel her and led her to Jesus. She came home that night and my daughter had also been crying. They cried together, and I foolishly thought that she had been crying because maybe there was some, you know, teenage girl incident, a queen bee kind of thing or something, you know. And she said, no, 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 Daddy. And she told me the story. And then she said this. This is what I want you to hear. I'll never forget it. She said, now I know why we're missionaries. I said, okay, what do you mean? She said, now I know why we do Chi Alpha because now I know what it feels like to bring somebody back to the Father. And she said, there's no, there's no feeling like it in the whole world. She said, now I, now I get it. Now I understand. And I, I, I said earlier, I said, if, if you've ever had that experience of watching somebody that you love, you really, really love them and you watch them suffer, You would do anything possible to alleviate that suffering. And and this is where we get into some kind of deep theological waters because we got to wrestle with this. There are theologians out there that say that there's nothing that you and I could do to add anything to the divine contentment. But when we wrestle with this and what we're saying, let's just bring that down to plain terms. Is there something that you and I can do to put a smile on the face of God? Is there something that you and I can do to actually bring joy to the one that we love more than anyone else? And I would say, yes, there actually is, because every time that we participate in his search and rescue mission to bring his lost lambs home, we put a smile on the face of our father. There's this, there's this incredible passage in Genesis 44, and we don't have to turn there, but I think most of you are probably familiar with this scenario. And in this passage, Judah is actually petitioning what he doesn't know to be his brother, Joseph, as the second in command of Egypt. Do you remember the story? And he's he's begging for Benjamin's life. Now, Judah had been complicit with the other brothers in selling Joseph into slavery, which is how the whole story got started. But in this moment in Genesis 44, years afterward, he's, he's putting himself forward and begging for this leader who happens to be Joseph, not to detain Benjamin. And here's what he says. He says, please do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. I'll trade places with you, please. You see, something incredible had shifted in Judah's heart. Before, he was jealous of the love of his father for Joseph, but now he actually loves his father so much He doesn't want to see his father in misery. I know that something would happen in the church to where all of us would understand that. Do not let me see the misery that would come upon our God if we don't bring his lost lambs home to him. And this is the the call to us. This is the ask to us. Do we know him well enough to both feel his pain when one is lost, but feel his rejoicing when one is found? And do we love him enough to participate? Can I be pretty bold with you and say that in that moment when my lost lamb was lost from me and separated, it's unthinkable to me that any of those 25 or 30 university students could have sat idly by and not entered into that search and rescue mission. It's unthinkable to me that any of them could have said, Eli, I love you, but I don't care about Corey. In other words, we can't call ourselves friends of God and not love what what he loves. Now, I actually do like to preach to the choir. 
and I know I'm preaching to the choir, your flag, Family Life Assembly, your, your commitment to missions to the lost is, is, is actually legendary among our fellowship of churches and our missionaries. I know that you love God, and I know that you participate. And what I'm asking is that we'd have a fresh revelation of the heart of God and that we do more. Can I tell you another, another story as we begin to wrap it up this morning? I was um, wrestling through these things myself a number of years ago, and part of probably, I'm just being honest with you, part of probably the aging process, I work with university students, they all stay the same age forever. <laughs> They're always 18 to 23. And Mary and I just keep getting older and older and older, you know. And so at, at one point, it was quite a few years ago during this process, we were just wrestling through that call. And uh, it was a particularly hard season. Um, and I'll tell you about a prayer time. I was actually in the middle of West Texas, driving through the middle of the night. And I it, situation, I had, I'd had to be at Angelo State University in San Angelo, Texas to preach a nighttime meeting. And the next morning, I had to be in Phoenix, Arizona. There's no flights. There was no way around it. I just had to drive through the night in West Texas. And if you've been to West Texas, anybody from West Texas, I don't want to say anything offensive to, to you about that. It's... It, it's, there's not a lot there. And um, I was actually doing anything I could to stay awake, um, drinking coffee, chewing on some sunflower seeds. And you, I don't want you to judge me for this, but I had to actually turn the radio on. And, and there was no Christian music. It, in West Texas, in the middle of the night, it's like 97.2, and you hit scan, and it goes, zip, 97.2. <laughs> That's what it is, Okay. And it was a country and western station, and I, I'm just trying to stay awake, but I'm praying. And this song comes on by a guy named Tim McGraw that maybe you've heard before, but the song is called Just to See You Smile. And it's a, it's a cute song, innocuous enough, I suppose. It's, a, it's about a, a young man, I, I suppose a young man, that is talking to his wife or his girlfriend about... I, I'd do anything to see you smile. I'd, I'd change jobs. I'd move to a different city. I'd, I'd do anything because to see you smile, that's the thing that I, that I live for. And um, I, I know this is cheesy, but I'm telling you, it's the, it's the honest truth. This, this redheaded preacher was driving at 3 a.m. in the middle of West Texas with the windows down and this song blaring, singing this at the top of my lungs with tears streaming down my face. And I, as much as I love Mary, I wasn't singing it to Mary. I was singing it to Jesus. And this is what the chorus says. Just to see you smile, Jesus. I'd do anything that you wanted me to. When all is said and done, I'll never count the cost. It's worth all that's lost just to see you smile. And Jesus didn't seem sing Tim McGraw when he went to the cross, but he could have, couldn't he? Jesus, why do you do this? Just to see the smile on the face of the heart of God. It's worth all that's lost. And Jesus said he would never count the cost just to see God smile. Let's stand together if you don't mind. us, Lord. Of course, Jesus is brilliant here, and we don't have time to really dig into it a lot, but do you remember what happened when the shepherd found the sheep? He 
Put it on his shoulders, yeah. And, and, and there's a key word there too that is the word joyfully. Joyfully put it on his shoulders. I, I talked about pets earlier. I'm kind of a dog guy, not a cat guy, if you didn't get that. I've had a few dogs that were runners, you know. They were like, you know what I mean by runner? Like they take off, you know, and you got to chase them. And I'm just being honest with you. When I when I finally catch up to that dog, I'm not normally joyfully putting it on my shoulder. You know what I mean? But this is a good shepherd. The Bible doesn't tell us how far he had to go or the darkness of the night that he had to travel through or the depths of the ravines he had to walk through. But I think we'd all agree it implies not just a short journey. Whatever you'd say about that, a mile or five miles or ten miles, when he finally found his lost sheep, he joyfully put it on his shoulders. Joyfully. And then you got to start the journey home. We, we could call that the burden of restoration. And in one way, only Jesus could carry the weight of the sin of the world and what Jesus did on the cross was once and for all and we can never replicate that but in another way he's calling all of us in the church to be shepherds and to actually carry the burden of restoration it's one thing to hand out a track it's another thing to extend an invitation but it's a radically different thing to become disciple makers Shepherds that find and feed and fight for the lost lambs of God. And the premise today is that if we love him, if we love him, then we'll know his heart and we'll join into that search and rescue mission joyfully, joyfully, joyfully. If you don't mind, would you bow your heads with me? And Close your eyes for just a moment. I, as we move into a time of prayer, I wonder if maybe there's somebody here who you have wandered away from Jesus. You've wandered away from the shepherd of your soul. And earlier I said something about a rocky precipice and salivating wolves and a scared lamb and I don't mean to make light of that because maybe that's where you find yourself. Or we mentioned the, the prodigal, the young man who had run away from his father's home and found himself in a situation he never intended to be in where he had spent all of his father's wealth, longing just to fill his stomach even with the pig food. He was so hungry for something real, something true. And maybe, maybe you're here today and you find yourself in that situation. The, Good news for you, for all of us here, is that Jesus says, God loves you so much that he will come for you. He will find you and pick you up in his loving arms and carry you back to your father's house. And that's his heart for you today. If you're away from him and you know that you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know that you need him. You don't even know the way home, but you need him to come for you. He will come for you even this morning. If you're here and that's your scenario and you are ready for Jesus to come for you, I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand and by doing that, just, just say, Jesus, I need you. I need the shepherd to come for me. Would you lift your hand if that's you? Yes, ma'am, I see that. Anybody else would lift your hand and say, that's me. That's me. We love you, Jesus, so much. We're so grateful. I can tell you in the very lifting of your hand, he's running to you even now. I wonder, with your heads bowed still and your, your eyes closed, is there, are those of you who are Christians here today, willing to be honest enough to say, you know, 
I do want a revelation of the heart of God. I recognize that my own heart is prone to be calloused and indifferent towards the mission of Christ, the cause of Jesus, the search and rescue mission of the Lord Jesus. My heart is not as tender as it could be towards lost people and lost things. And I'd like to open my, open my mind and open my heart to a real revelation of the suffering of God. Or maybe we'd be so honest to say, you know what, I've not rejoiced sufficiently when the lost lambs have come home. I've sat somewhat indifferently through water baptism services and the level of rejoicing in my heart is not commensurate with what I read about that happens in heaven. And God, I want a tender heart, I want a soft heart. I wanna know you. Would you raise your hand if that's you? Would you, would you say, Lord, would you, would you just breathe on me again? Would you do something so that I can know you? Yeah, so many of us. Jesus, a baptism of your spirit is what we ask for today. You take away a heart of stone in some of us and give us a heart of flesh, a heart that knows you, a heart that loves you, a heart that is willing to not count the cost. A heart that loves you so much, that just longs and longs and longs to put a smile on your face. Lord, we said the worst thing in all of life is to see someone that we love grieve and suffer, but the greatest thing probably in all of life is to see someone that we truly love rejoice and smile, and this is what we long for, Lord. We wanna be participants in your rescue mission for your lost lambs. So Lord, baptize us in your Holy Spirit. Give us the heart that knows you and that loves you. And give us the willingness to carry the burden of restoration, to participate with you in that. Now for the next just couple of moments, what I'd like to do is begin to intercede. for the lost lambs of God. And what we're gonna do is, we call this popcorn prayer. What that means is that just throughout the congregation, you're gonna call out names of people that you love. For some of you, they're family members. For others, it would be coworkers. For some of you, it would be neighbors. For Others, it'll be a whole host of different people, but you know that these are people dearly loved by God, that Jesus would spare no cost to rescue. So just as loud as you feel comfortable, because we want to agree together as a congregation, would you just begin in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of the Holy Spirit? Would you, just one at a time, we're just going to, we're going to take our time here, just begin to Call out the name of somebody that you know Jesus died for and loves that needs to come home. Colin, Julie. Yes, Jesus. Other names. Yes, sir. Wanna, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, Jesus. Oh, God, yes. Yes, God. Yes, God. John, I heard John. Yes, Lord Jesus. <sighs> Ernie, God, you know, you know where he's at. Joseph, yes, Jesus. Yes. Ashley, too. Yes, God. And Ryan, yes. Yes, oh, Father. And Blake, oh God, touch him today. And Matthew, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. For Daniel today, Jesus. God, give us a heart, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. 
More names. Don't be bashful. Melanie. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. Christine. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord God. Yes, Lord God. Yes, Lord God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, intercede through us. Intercede through us, Holy Spirit. Intercede through us. Oh, God, oh, God. Give us your heart. Give us your heart. Give us your heart. Give us your heart for Noor, for Noor and Imad today, Jesus. Father, we remember that you love these more than we love them, infinitely more. We don't have to twist your arm, but we do ask for a release of your precious Holy Spirit. Even now in this very moment, Holy Spirit, would you go to them? You know where they are, Lord. You know where they are exactly in this moment. They might be sleeping in. They might be out at the lake. Some of them are behind prison bars, but you know where they are and you know what they need. So we ask for a release of the Holy Spirit of God to go and whisper into their ears the love, the truth, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask for you, Holy Father, to wrap your strong arms of love around them and to pick them up wherever they are today. Whatever depths of despair that they're in, would you go and would you lift them up, Lord? Would you break the chains that have held them back? Would you penetrate the dark places with the light of your truth, Lord Jesus? Would you break down those walls of hardness, Lord? There'd be tenderness again, Lord. Holy Spirit, you alone can do that. We ask that you would do that this very morning. And God, we again pledge ourselves to be a part of what you're doing, be a part of the mission of the church to save the lost, Lord. We ask you for wisdom and discernment for some of us this morning to send a text message, to write a letter, to maybe even make a visit on our way home from church, if that's possible, Lord, to be a part knowing when to speak up and when to stay silent and pray, Lord. We look forward, we long for that day when your lost lambs will be brought back into the fold. Even here at Family Life Assembly, we will rejoice with the angels of heaven when they're baptized here in this church and brought back into the family of God. Lord, we believe with our hearts that that's your will and that's your desire. And we participate with you. You're a good shepherd, Jesus. Help us, we pray. How many of you appreciate the ministry of Brother Eli Gaudreau? I just want to remind you that he and Mary are one of your missionaries. You support them monthly with finances and with prayer, and uh, we appreciate it. But one of our one of your missionaries doing a stellar job. As he was speaking, I grew up in church, and I grew up quoting John 3.16. How many of you, maybe you grew up in church and you grew up quoting John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and so forth. And honestly, I would just quote that, but it was just rote. After a while, you get so used to it. Until I heard someone preach one time, and he said, every time you quote it, Add an accent and exaggerate one word, and it would change 
the impact of that verse. And he said, next time you quote John 3, 16, say like this. For God so loved the world. Now when I quote that, I always quote it. For God so loved the world because it gives it a lot of meaning. It doesn't say for God loved the world. For God so loved the world. That was a powerful message Brother Eli preached today to remind us of the heart of the Lord. For he so loved the world. He so loved you. Some of you were, you were a mess. Even you didn't love yourself. But God so loved you. And that's what we do while we do. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to close in prayer. After you pray, you're welcome to greet our speakers. Also, I've asked Pastor Russell and Joanne uh, uh, Joyce, our prime timers pastor, to make their way. They're at a table outside. And if you would just drop by and let them know how much we appreciate them and congratulate them on their 50th wedding anniversary. If you have a, an expression of appreciation, you're welcome to leave that there also. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many of you... Um, are going to continue praying for our missionaries. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Let them know. That's a lot of work. Amen. Let them know. And Brother Eli mentioned if you have a name and a contact of a student in a secular university, um, you could either write that, give that to her, or if for some reason you didn't get an opportunity this morning, just email that to the church office. And we'll make sure that the church office forwards that to them. Amen. And if there is a nearby Chi Alpha ministry for that student, we'll, they'll refer that to them. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be reminded about you. Be reminded how much you so love the world. Father, I thank you that you have reminded us about your heart. How everything that you have done by sending your son and then the Holy Spirit and salvation at home, everything, the Calvary, everything is because you loved us. You love humanity. You love the world. You love everybody. And Father, I just pray that our hearts would be sensitive to your love. Lord, I, I pray that the angels won't upstage us. That we are so in tune with the Father's countenance. That whenever someone comes to the Lord, we rejoice even more than the angels because it pleases you. Lord, thank you for raising up a, a missions church, a church that is not just committed to seeing more people added to the building, but seeing people added to the kingdom of God. We love you. I pray a blessing upon each person here today. Everyone in our Spanish language church is meeting on campus at the same time. And all the children's and children's church. In Jesus' name, God bless you, love one another. We'll see you in church Wednesday night at our midweek church, 7 p.m. God bless you. Amen.